I have a spooky, scary science story to tell you about spiders. Now, I am a physicist, not a biologist. So when I think spider, I think like Charlotte's Web or Shelob, like the solitary creatures that live alone, they hunt alone. Like maybe they'll wrap up a little fly and leave it next to the eggs for their babies to eat. But other than that, they're alone. But it turns out that like 20% of spiders are colonial spiders. They live in these massive nests that they work together to build and they have like a separate little nest that they use to hunt and they work together to take down predators and like like spiders that are this big are taking on things 10 times their size like moths like just a team of spiders working together to take down a giant creature compared to their size dude rats rats have been found in these nests you know how big a rat is compared to a spider and it turns out well if you have three thousand spiders you can take down a rat and that that's terrifying um the reason i haven't heard of these spiders is because i live in north america and they live in like south america central america africa so behavioral ecologists want to study these colonies. So they'll go and they'll collect a colony, bring it back to their lab, breed the spiders, get multiple colonies going because the colonies, like the spider's lifetime is like a year, right? So you need to have multiple going at one time to study them. And they're thinking like, okay, they work together. Like, do they communicate? How do they communicate? Do spiders have personalities? Like, what if you have a bunch of really bold spiders? who are just really aggressive and they're much more willing to like fight bigger creatures. Would that influence how the colony behaves versus having like a bunch of shy spiders? How do you tell if a spider has a personality? Again, as a physicist, I'm like, how, how do you test the personality of spiders? How do you test boldness? And, and luckily biologists are super specific in the methodologies of their papers. And I can tell you exactly how you would test for boldness in a spider. You take your little spider and you take a little snot nose sucker, like for a baby, and you get a little puff of air. Like as a response to the puff of air, the spider curls up into like the fetal position version for a spider and a bold spider will uncurl in like milliseconds or like a second. And a shy spider will stay curled up and kind of wait the situation out for minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes. And you could do this test on your spider multiple times and tell, okay, are they on average very bold? Like they're jumping out, they're ready to go very quickly or on average, are they really shy? And then you can start doing interesting things like what if I take a colony with just bold spiders? Uh, are they better at communicating? Meaning, do they take down prey faster? Are they faster to attack? Do they have more babies? Are the babies more successful? And then you could do the opposite, right? Like, here's a colony with only shy spiders. Are they less successful when they're like attacking a giant moth prey? Are they less successful at like having offspring and feeding offspring? Like, what is the difference? And of course, you would keep your standard sample for comparison. And you could make statements like, I measured the personality of spiders. Here's how that affects the group dynamic, the group behavior. So essentially what's happened is a American lab went to South Africa, collected a non-native species to America, brought them back to America, bred them to be more bold and more aggressive and trained them on how to attack prey. And the scary thing, the scary thing is that none of it was real. The data was fake. The papers were published, but were based on fake data. Did you even have spiders in the lab? Do spiders have personalities? Well, now we don't know. This is a story about fake data, fake science data, a spooky, scary story about fake data. Let me tell you the story, the timeline. The year is 2012. Kate Leskowski, graduate student in behavioral ecology, biology. I don't know, I'm sorry, I'm a physicist. Goes to a conference, meets another 
recently graduated graduate student, Jonathan Pruitt. They discuss their work and she's like, I have an idea for a spider science research project. What if we took a bold spider, we put them in the colony for a couple of weeks and then we took the bold spider out. Is the colony gonna be more bold without that spider there? How long do we have to leave the spider in to make the colony adapt to this new personality? And eight months later, after the conference, after the discussion, they write the paper. And the paper has this plot where in gray, you see that if you leave the spider, the bold spider in for multiple weeks, you see the effect. It's as if the spiders have adapted to that new spider. Now they are behaving as if the bold spider was there. A bold spider can influence the personalities of the other spiders. What an amazing result. So they write more papers together. They have a series. The second paper has now Dr. Kate, a second co-author, Pierre Olivier Montiglio, also a doctor, recent graduate, and Dr. Jonathan Pruitt. And there's a third paper in the series. Great collaboration. They all move on to different animals, different bugs. Now it is November of 2019. Years later, they have moved on from this collaboration. They all have professorships at different universities. When Dr. Kate receives an email from a colleague and he says, hey, there's some anomalies in the data from this 2016 paper. Um, can you explain this? What a terrifying email to receive. So she's like, oh, he's probably noticing that there is an excess of values of 600. So they're measuring the boldness of the spiders before and after interactions and they puff the little air, the spider curls up and some spiders curl up for such a long time that they just stop the clock at 10 minutes. So a lot of entries will say 600 and that's why you have so many 600s. Like they would have gone longer than 600 but you don't need to take data, you know they're not bold. So she starts writing up that explanation and then she goes to check the data and she sees what he's talking about. It's not an excess of 600. It's an excess of second digit values like 1.21, 1.21, 1.21. And that, that doesn't make sense. When you're measuring time on like a stopwatch, it would be odd for all of your spiders to do something to the same 10 milliseconds. Like that's strange, it doesn't make sense. And she's like, this is anomalous. So she thanks the person who emailed her and he's like, you need to look into this or I'm gonna email the journals. And she emails her co-authors and she's like, what is this? What is this, what's happened? And Jonathan Pruitt responds very quickly and he's like, oh, we measured the spiders in batches. That's why you have so many of the same value. So like, instead of saying, okay, we have five spiders and five stopwatches and we're gonna puff them and they'll curl and we'll push the button. You have 40 spiders, you puff them all, <laughs> they all curl and like, you're like, okay, that group did like 1.21, this group, you can keep going on the stopwatch. She's a little annoyed because it's like, okay, that's an explanation. That explains why you have so many of the same value, but but she thinks like if you're measuring them in batches, you need to have tell me, you need to tell me that so I can put that in the methodology and say, this is why there are so many of the same values. And also if we're measuring them in batches, that affects the statistics, the significance of our results. Because when you're doing error analysis, there is a lot more error in one stopwatch for 40 spiders versus one stopwatch for one spider. And that is gonna affect like the error bars how significant is your result? <sighs> the paper has to be retracted. So she emails her co-authors who are CC'd when she emails the editor of the journal that the paper was published in and says, there's some anomalies in our data. We have to retract this paper. So the plan is to retract this 2016 paper with these three co-authors and oftentimes instead of getting a true retraction, you can instead issue a correction. Like we found this anomaly in our data, we could redo the statistics, redo the plots, resubmit, and now in the future when people download that paper, it'll have like an erratum added. That's like an explanation. True retractions are usually for like 
ethical issues like plagiarism or fake data. So Dr. Kate, she's looking through the data and she's like, how is this gonna change what the plots look like? Can we still stand by our conclusions? And she starts reorganizing the spreadsheet and she finds rather than like blocks of data, it's whole repeated sequences. Yikes. As if someone had copied and pasted and copied and pasted so that when someone does do analysis, they get this nice, beautiful plot. So these repeated sequences that now do not look like block data taking, but instead look like copy and pasting, perhaps an error, means that you have to remove those. You can't trust those repeated sequences. And Dr. Kate finds that she has to remove 73% of the data in order to get rid of all those repeated sequences and the conclusions they no longer hold. The result they found is no longer significant. It's got to be a full retraction. Late November 2019, the paper is retracted fully on January 17th, 2020. In between that time, Dr. Kate, she's like, but why? Who? How did this happen? A full retraction, unreliable data. Who's responsible? You have your three co-authors, Dr. Kate Lazowski, Dr. Pierre Olivier Montiglio, Dr. Jonathan Pruitt. They were all recent graduates in 2016 when this paper was written. They are all now professors. Who's responsible? But like, you know who's responsible because only one person had a lab. Only one person had spiders. Only one person had the data. So Dr. Kate has become suspicious. She no longer trusts this 2016 paper, but what about the 2014 papers? So she pulls up the original email where Jonathan Pruitt had emailed the spider data that she did the analysis on. And I'm gonna make the assumption that Dr. Kate never opened the spreadsheet because why would you look at a spreadsheet? You're gonna write some sort of like R code to read the spreadsheet and do analysis. Like you would never physically open a spreadsheet. And I'm kind of curious why they're even saving data into a spreadsheet because it would be really easy to like overwrite and stuff. I'm surprised by that, but she opens the spreadsheet. Years later, it's November, 2019. She's spending her Thanksgiving break looking at this spreadsheet and she sorts the data again because that's how she found the repeated sequences in the other spreadsheet. And she sees, she sees the same thing, repeated sequences. And she's like, fuck. Or I imagine she's like, fuck. Cause it's the same. That means this paper is gonna have to be retracted too. So she's looking at the data and her spreadsheet and you know how spreadsheets are actually books and you have a sheet. And then if you go down, there's like a little tab and you can make multiple sheets. So she's like, I'm gonna start taking notes because I'm gonna have to email the editor of the journal and say, here's the anomalies. We have to retract this paper. She clicks on sheet two and, and she finds the same data, but instead of being laid out as like entries, it's laid out in long form as if someone was just faking all the data and typing out exactly what sequences to type to get the result they wanted to get for the paper. <sighs> So someone had laid it out in sheet two, rearranged it in sheet one to make it look like they had actually taken data, whereas sheet two proves that they were just faking it all. Things have gone awry. Things aren't working out so well. So she emails Jonathan Pruitt because there were only two co-authors on this paper and she's like, why does sheet two exist? And he says, that's an interesting question. Retraction. 
She again removes the duplicate data. She finds the results from this paper no longer hold this beautiful plot is wrong. Do spiders have personalities? I guess we don't know at this moment. So this is still November. She emails the journal again. She's like, another retraction. Um, and they're like, okay, write up your retraction statements, send it in. The first paper, like through all the paperwork, like over the holidays is fully retracted January 17th. And a retraction is published the same way a paper is published. So something scientists do is they wake up and they have their coffee and they're scrolling through I, do biologists have the archive i assume it's the archive just the listing of papers that are out today and everyone's like oh shit retraction because scientists are gossipy little turds they're like why is this a retraction because again retractions are pretty serious you only do it if you can't trust the data um, and all these people know each other. They all go to conferences. They all go to graduate school together. They all work together in different ways. And they're all like, Dr. Kate, what's going on? Jonathan Pruitt, what, what's, what's going on? And so what does Jonathan Pruitt do? He goes to Africa, field work. He, he can't respond to these emails about the fake data. He's doing field work. Dr. Kate, as a response, a preemptive, response in mid-January, just after the retraction, puts up a blog post that's like, what should you do if you don't trust your data? And it just kind of outlines the timeline of events. Like, here's the timeline. Someone emailed me, I checked the data, I found this, I asked Jonathan his response, he said this, we've retracted, the other paper is also suspect retraction forthcoming. And he's in Africa, he's not responding. Dr. Kate is left with the fallout and they're like, why didn't you know? How could you let this happen? How can you just have fake data and not notice? So she appends her blog post with like, here are all the things I checked. I will post my R code. This is what I check. You check the data. You wouldn't see it unless you were looking for fake data. And why would you look for fake data? Because science is built on trust. Why would someone fake data? Isn't it scary that someone could just fake data and send you a spreadsheet and like not even have looked at the spiders? Like, how did this happen? I don't know how it happened. Here's how I'm gonna start checking my data in the future. And that blog post is still up and it's great. And it kind of reads as like, if this ever happens to anyone else, here's what you should do. So that is the start of February. Dr. Kate has published this blog post. Two papers are undergoing a retraction process. One is fully retracted. Everyone is suspicious of Jonathan Pruitt's data and he is in Africa doing field work. This is when I tune in. Like it's February of 2020. I have a lot of time on my hands. I'm home a lot more now. This was my Tiger King. This was my sourdough bread. I would follow these these behavioral ecologists on Twitter just being like, all right, I'm going to check these papers from 2017. Has anyone checked his thesis? And every day new things would pop up. Like apparently biologists are really good about posting their data, posting their spreadsheets. So you publish the paper, you could just see the data. You could do your own analysis on the data. So that's what people are doing who they also have a lot of time on their hands because they're home because it's February 2020. So people are downloading the spreadsheets, doing mass analysis on all the data that Jonathan Pruitt has ever published. And they're finding repeated sequences. It's baffling to think that someone would fake data, but it's even more baffling to think that they didn't feel the need to scrub the evidence of the fake data from the spreadsheets. Jump to August 2020. Every day more stuff is coming out. People are like, have we noticed this on, on Twitter? Jonathan Pruitt not responding to anybody. The journals are, are in the process of retracting over 10 papers. It is academic job season. Every single person who's ever worked or published with Jonathan Pruitt, who was incredibly prolific, publishing so many papers, they are now questioning if they should put those papers on their CVs. At this time, he had nine graduate students and postdocs, 
all of those people need to find new labs. And how can they do that when they can't put their papers on their CVs? Like a postdoc who did have nine papers now has four papers and has to apply for faculty jobs and be like, I don't, I don't know why I didn't see it. I, I don't, I'm sorry why it looks like three years of their academic life was spent doing nothing. And I can't imagine the interviews they had to go to because it had to have come up. It had to just overshadow their whole career as like, but how come you didn't notice the fake data? So it is mid-August. Six papers have been fully retracted, but there's 15 more that are questionable. So someone makes a spreadsheet a Google Doc where they're like, we've checked these papers, they look okay. This long list is still in question and these have been fully retracted. And it was like a tool for people to know which papers they could still cite, which papers they could still put on their CVs. And then since it's 2020, what do you do if you're Jonathan Pruitt? You lawyer up. So he is a lawyer. He sends out a, <laughs> like, a cease-ish and desist-ish, just a vaguely stop doing this, stop hashtag Pruitt data on Twitter. He sends the person who made the spreadsheet like, this is not okay. You need to wait for the formal investigation by his university, which is McMaster's university. You need to wait till they do their formal investigation. He sends letters to the journals from his lawyer that are like, you are not following proper protocol. Like, everyone's ganging up on me it's not fair he uses the freedom of information act to request emails from all of his former co-authors and colleagues to be like i need to see the emails where he mentioned jonathan and pruitt because it's a conspiracy you're out to get me i'm just gonna re read some of the lawyer letter private and confidential without prejudice um it's funny because like you can't just say something is confidential <laughs> so obviously this was immediately posted all over the internet. Please be advised that our firm has been retained by Jonathan Pruitt with respect to the investigation, if any, being conducted by removed. Over the last number of weeks, there has been an online campaign directed at Dr. Pruitt and his work, which has come to be known as hashtag Pruitt data and hashtag Pruitt gate. As part of the hashtag Pruitt gate, a number of academics have organized an extra institutional online forum for posting, reviewing, and criticizing the data integrity of various of Dr. Pruitt's research studies and papers. Dr. Pruitt disagrees that there are any grounds for this paper's retraction. Any decision about retraction must be conducted fairly and in keeping with professional norms. It does not appear that this paper meets any of the criteria for retraction as set out by the COPE guidelines. In addition, I am concerned that the procedural fairness of any investigation has been hampered by the manner in which Dr. Pruitt's work is currently being criticized online. This social media campaign and online forums which spurred this complaint break the normative practices of the field and very likely prevent a fair assessment of Dr. Pruitt's work. The controversy over this particular paper highlights the problem with using unmediated online forum to attack the data integrity of the body of work. In this case, it appears that the wrong electronic file was uploaded to the forum. The final published paper does not rely on impugned data. So all of these people become like a little scared, like they don't want to be sued, like the Google Doc is taken down, I cannot find any evidence of it. It turns out if you want to retract a paper, you need to write a retraction statement with every single co-author. And while like all these papers with Jonathan Pruitt, like four authors are agreeing, Jonathan Pruitt is like, no, we can do a correction, we can do something else. And now he's sent this legal document, like he's getting lawyers involved, they're kind of scared to sign it. So like the process just kind of stops. And it's been, it's August, 2020. It's almost a full year since the discovery of November, 2019. And everyone's just like, well, what is happening now? Are we waiting for some investigation by the journals? What are the journals doing? How long can this go on? So he is lawyered up, you know, without prejudice, fully confidential letters have been sent. Um, his concern is that the, the online campaign is going to affect the journal's reaction to the papers. And now the journals are kind of concerned about that as well. So it's August 
of 2020, 10 months since the initial letter was sent to the journal, and everyone is like, what are the journals doing? Why is this taking so long? Why can't they just retract all these papers and everyone can move on? What is this investigation at the university? Is he still employed as a researcher? What are the journals doing? What is happening? On May 12th, 2021, Professor Dan Bolnick posts a blog post titled 17 months. And in it, he outlines how his role as editor of the American Naturalist, the first journal to get involved in the retraction process has been played out since November 17th, 2019. It's important to note because it came up a lot that Professor Dan Boltnick has worked with Jonathan Pruitt before. They have co-authored a paper together that's since been retracted. And when he received the first email from the whistleblower and also Dr. Kate, he was shocked because he is friends and academic colleagues with Jonathan Pruitt. He receives that email from Dr. Kate and the whistleblower. Two days later, Jonathan Pruitt, on his own, emails Dr. Dan, and he's like, I can explain. I've heard that you've heard about this. It's because I took the data in batches. That's the explanation. But because Dr. Dan has been in contact with Dr. Kate, he's like, okay, but that doesn't explain the repeated sequences, the copy and paste it. By the way, do you have any videos of this virus? He does not. November 26th, Kate sends her analysis script and she's like, just use this on the data and you will see the repeated sequences. You'll see that batches of 40 does not explain this. And you'll also see that when I remove that data, our conclusions no longer hold. Now it's early December. Jonathan Pruitt, unaware that Dr. Dan has this analysis script, writes up a correction and he's like, see, we've accounted for the batch data. Here's a correction to the paper. Dr. Kate emails separately and she's like, we need a retraction. This is a full retraction, full stop. December 17th, 2019, Jonathan Pruitt agrees. He signs the retraction. That paper is retracted January 17th of 2020. I'm so curious about this moment because did he think that that was it? Like obviously Jonathan Pruitt knows that he's been faking data for over a decade. He knows that that data is posted publicly. Does he think if he signs this one retraction, everyone's just gonna stop looking like it's, it's over? I'm curious how he felt like what he thought was happening because he does not give at all. Um, Dr. Dan is like, do you have paper copies of the data? We could make a new spreadsheet and see. And he's like, no, no. So Dr. Dan calls former undergrads because obviously the undergrads were the ones doing the data taking this whole time. Jonathan Pruitt threw them under the bus a little bit and was like, maybe there's an error with the undergrads. Maybe they lost the papers. And the undergrads are like, we always took data on paper. We never looked at spiders in batches of 40. It was always five to eight spiders with five to eight stopwatches. So a stopwatch for each spider. We put the data in this location on paper and he says that he has it and he stores it. And for some reason, Jonathan Pruitt can't find the paper copies. It's January, 2020. The other journals start contacting Dr. Dan because he's the first one to get involved with this. They saw the retraction and now they're like, hey, people are sending us more information about these other papers. Like, how are you guys handling it? The public, the community, the hashtag Pruitt data don't know that the journals are talking to each other, that multiple journals are having the same issue with this unrepeatable, unreliable data. And this is where Dr. Dan, he starts documenting everything. He's like, I need more people involved. I need some more behavioral ecologists to look at this data and see what's happening. I need unrelated data analysis people to see if they find these fake data. Because there are a couple ways you can fake data, right? 
they find like these repeated sequences as if someone's not even taking data. They're just like 1.21, 1.21, 1.21. 1 and then they find repeated like events, like multiple data entries, just copied, block, pasted, block. And this is more like someone took data, they made the plot, the result they wanted to see wasn't there, so they found entries that would make that result happen and pasted them a bunch of times, so you get a nice little plot. The final way to fake data is to take your independent variable and just make up a bunch of data that's a function of your dependent variable. They're finding formulas in the spreadsheets where Pruitt has calculated the independent variable as a function of the dependent variable. So if he's publishing a paper that's saying like, I think this is related to this, his actual data is just like this is this times three. So it's like, obviously you found a correlation because you made it a function of that data. And he then published the data with the spreadsheet, with the, the equation still in the spreadsheet, like literally faking data to show that something is a function of something else, even though you wrote the data to be a function of something else. So it's obviously there. And that was left in the spreadsheet. Like someone just downloaded all the data he had ever posted and control F an equal sign and they found equations. It had equations in the spreadsheets. This is also happening in January of 2020. Dr. Dan sees this in the report from the analysis team that he's asked to do analysis. People also find it and start talking about it on Twitter and they're like, okay, this is not a mistake. This is not data mismanagement. This is just fake data. So it's early February 2020. Dr. Dan is receiving these retraction requests from authors like, hey, we looked at our data with Jonathan. This is a bad paper. And Jonathan refuses to sign. And he's like, we'll write a correction. I'll find the date. We'll do a correction. And everyone's like, it has to be a retraction. And Jonathan refuses. It's March 15th. And Dr. Dan is starting to worry that his relationship with Jonathan is going to affect how people see the results of the investigation by the journal. So he asked that independent team he had assembled to write up a report without his input and say, what do you think should be done? Should all of these papers be retracted? The reports returned in April, mid-April, April 20th, and sent to every single co-author, to Jonathan, to all these people who are like, should we need to retract this paper? And it shows like each paper step-by-step, step, here's the errors in the data. Here's how we know this is fake data. Um, Jonathan immediately criticizes the report. He's like, this team, the people you've assembled, they're out to get me. We can correct this. It doesn't have to be retractions. And the journal is like, we can't retract the paper unless all authors agree to retract the paper. And Jonathan Pruitt, the cause of this mess, will not retract the papers. Now it's April 30th, 2020. Jonathan and Dr. Dan are emailing every single day, multiple times a day, and he's like, what if we removed all the extraneous data and we just redid the analysis on the papers? And Dr. Dan is like, we discussed this in the report. You don't know which data is reliable and which data is not reliable. If it's copied and pasted, how do you know if there was an original, what the original was? Did the paste overwrite other data? Unless you have the paper copies of the data, unless you have videos of the spiders, we cannot do this. Do you have the paper copies? Do you have the data? No response. No, just no retractions. No, here's the data, nothing. Now it's May. It's been seven months. The University of Chicago Press, which publishes the journal, Dr. Dan is the editor-in-chief for, wants to publish an expression of concern about all these papers to say, these are, these are all in danger of being retracted. Please stay tuned for a follow-up. He notifies the co-authors who are like, great, something's happening. He notifies Jonathan who's like, I understand that you have to do this mere hours later. Jonathan never contacts Dr. Dan again. He receives a letter from a lawyer. The lawyer is stating that Dr. Dan's involvement is ruining the investigation. Um, the people on the committee who wrote the report are out to get him. Like it's all 
unfair. It's not a real investigation. You cannot publish this expression of concern. The University of Chicago Press receives this letter from the lawyer and, and asks Dr. Dan to pause the investigation. They don't think he should be able to continue. And this is in May. August 8, 2020. Dr. Dan receives the go-ahead to continue with the investigation. Like, apparently, they've contacted the lawyers, they've sorted it out, they're like, go ahead. And this is the time when everyone's like, what are the journals doing? What is happening? And Dr. Dan is like, I'm not allowed to discuss it. It is this point when everyone has received these, these lawyer letters. They've all been scared of signing their retractions, but now they get the go-ahead. Everyone signs the retractions on all of these papers except Jonathan Pruitt, which means that in some cases a retraction was issued, in some cases the authors removed their names and now it's just a paper with just Jonathan Pruitt. For example, Dr. Dan, who had published a paper with Jonathan Pruitt, his was corrected instead of retracted with all authors removed except for Jonathan Pruitt. So from August of 2020 to May of 2021, Dr. Dan, the journals, they're all dealing with this, this fact that like, can we retract these papers if one of the authors refuses? Like, what do we have to do? Like, do we have to wait for McMaster University to do some sort of investigation? Like, what is, what is happening? And it's May 2021. It's August 2021. What, what is happening? Like, he's still He's still on the website at McMaster's University as a professor. He still has active grants. Like the papers haven't all been retracted yet. What is happening? A second job season where anyone who's ever co-authored with Jonathan Pruitt has to have an explanation and have a cute little story about how they didn't know it was fake data. How did no one know? And, and nothing's happening? Nothing's happening? at all? That's it? November 11th, 2021, someone notices that Jonathan Pruitt's PhD thesis has been withdrawn. Is he no longer Dr. Jonathan Pruitt? They found the same type of fake data in his PhD thesis. Over a decade of faking data. July 10th, 2022, Jonathan Pruitt resigns from McMaster's University. Yes, yeah, seven months since his PhD thesis was withdrawn, two and a half years after the fake data was noticed, he resigns. So many questions about the timeline. How do you fake data for over a decade and publish so many papers and never tell anyone? Just looking at his Google Scholar page, 6,051 citations, an H index of 41. For comparison, minus six. <laughs> Just an insane amount of citations and papers. Here's the scary thing about fake data. Like every single article that Jonathan Pruitt has ever published is now suspect, right? You cannot trust the conclusions of those papers. But also every single paper that cited those experiments now has to be reviewed. Like if you build on a fake experiment, you can't really trust the conclusions of your experiment either because you started on a false premise. You at least need to rewrite the paper to be factual. Do spiders have personalities? Do we know? Um, and it's not just this, the paper's that cited like if you write a review paper if you have any results from Pruitt papers you need to retract your re review and rewrite it like a full decade of spider research is now just invalid and it's not just spiders what if you're a good little scientist who works on ants 
and you read papers out of your fields because you're a good scientist and you see this experiment and you're like, I'm gonna do the same experiment. And you conclude that unlike spiders, ants do not have personalities or something. Like they, they, the paper is wrong now because you don't know anything about spiders because the, the spider papers were fake. This hashtag Pruitt data thing happened about the same time where I personally was like, I've got to get out of academia. Like I am not happy here. And I kept thinking about that when I saw like the tweets from his colleagues and former students and how like people who wanted to stay in academia were now going to be forced out just because of one man's actions, like one person fake data and now a postdoc who had five publications has three publications and has to explain that huge gap on their CV every time they go to a job interview because to be an academic you have to consistently be the top of your field and something like this can just destroy any chance you have at like a professor position if that's what you want and I saw one tweet where this guy was just compiling like the amount of time he had wasted on this, like all this time taking data only for Jonathan Pruitt to lose the paper sheets and make up his own data. All this time at conferences and giving talks that are now meaningless because the data was fake, all this time writing emails and writing papers and reviewing the papers, just wasted time because it was fake and the papers are gone. And Jonathan Pruitt liked that tweet. And yet, because I was thinking about academia, I can't help myself but feel compassion for Jonathan Pruitt. Like, Faking data, unexcusable, but it happens in science because of the way academia is built. Like you have to be the best every year. Every single result you have has to be amazing and beautiful. Like, like why didn't anyone spot the fake data? Because no one repeats experiments, because you do not get funding if you repeat experiments. If you write a proposal and you're like, I would like to repeat this experiment that someone did with this little spin on it, they'll be like, but that's not novel. That's not interesting. Have you even read Pruitt 2014? So like, there is no way in academia for anyone to notice that data is fake unless you're specifically looking for fake data. There is no incentive to redo an experiment. There is all the incentive in the world to make a fake plot with an amazing result. Like what are the odds that you get caught? He got away with it for over a decade. He was at a professorship. He was getting more impressive professorships as his career went on right up till the end. Like I take back the compassion. I feel sympathy. Like I, I understand how it could happen and how it could snowball. Like academia rewards this behavior. And you can see from his career, like so many publications, so many like increasingly prestigious positions, like tons of collaborators. Everyone liked working with Jonathan Pruitt. I watched a couple of his colloquiums. He's an incredibly enigmatic speaker. He's very passionate about science. And the community, at least from my reading of hashtag Pruitt data, seemed very like upset that this happened to their friend and colleague. They were angry that they had wasted so much time. But there was also this, this sympathy, this like, oh, Jonathan, like this happened to him. And a lot of people were worried that he was going to do something incredibly drastic. Like Dr. Dan kept talking about like, I was in contact with his friends and his relatives and making sure someone was with him because 
that's a thing that happens in academia where it's like my experiment went wrong. People think their life is over. And like Jonathan Pruitt's life as a scientist is over. Like you fake data, there's, there's no coming back, which is probably why he kept being like, we can correct it. We'll find the papers, we'll do a correction. No, we don't need to retract it. So even, even with the decade of lying to everyone's face and getting a lawyer and sending these scary letters and liking this tweet on Twitter, I still feel you shouldn't have done that. All your papers are retracted, but I feel for you as a person. The only other YouTuber I've seen talk about this had a similar reaction. I'll link it below. He immediately was like, I've heard stories of people doing this and ending their lives and we don't want that to happen. On August 26, 2021, Jonathan Pruitt tweeted, I will take responsibility for what I have done. If I must fall, I will rise each time a better man which is a quote from a Brandon Sanderson book with a hashtag am writing fantasy, which seems that's what Jonathan Pruitt is doing now uh, from his Twitter, which is now deleted. He talked about writing like a fantasy novel about gay cats, I think, which I'm not being facetious at all. I would totally read. It sounds like Redwall, but for like adults, like send me a copy. Um, but I don't think he took responsibility. I think that he really could have benefited from a public apology and just a statement of like, I did fake the data. And Dr. Dan kept talking like while everyone was investigating, he was communicating with Jonathan Pruitt a lot. And he was like, it would save everyone a lot of time if you would just write a blog post and say, this is what happened. This is why I did it. And he never did. and. I think the community would still benefit from that. Just, and honestly, it would probably sell more than a fantasy book. Just like, this is what happened. This is my fault, but also the culture of academia caused this. Here are my suggestions for the future. Jonathan Pruitt will never work as a scientist again. At least I imagine, I don't know. Um, but I think he could still contribute in a way to stop letting this happen. Why do we accept this is how academia is? It had equations in the spreadsheets.